In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Well, for this morning's message, I'm going to be preaching through Psalm 130. And before I dig into the text, I need to share a little bit of background about this psalm. Now, have you ever noticed sometimes when you're reading through the psalms that in the very beginning of the psalms, sometimes they kind of have a little phrase or almost like a paragraph explaining different things about the psalms? Uh, You know, sometimes it says, well, this is the person that wrote it. Sometimes there's some other weird words that we don't really know, right? Well, this is one of those psalms. This is Psalm 130. And if you notice in your Bibles, in Psalm 130, there's a little phrase that says that this is a song of ascent. Now, psalms generally were were sung, you know, by by the Hebrews, right? So this would have been a song that, that was sung, and it was called a song of ascent. Now... If, if you're curious, there are 14 other songs of ascents. Now, unfortunately, we don't know everything there is to know about what a song of ascent was or is. But most scholars agree on a few things that sets apart the songs of ascent, right? These 15 psalms were used by the Jews primarily as they were traveling to Jerusalem to remind them of different aspects of their relationship with God, right? And the main theme of Psalm 130 is that of repentance, right? It's turning from our sins and turning towards God. It's it's really a common theme really for Christians as well, right? But as the Jews would sing and read these songs, they would be moved to reflect on how they need to turn from their sins and turn towards God. And they oftentimes sung these as they were traveling to Jerusalem. Uh, Now, on a side note, Martin Luther, kind of the the, the namesake founder of our church, had four favorite psalms. And if you're wondering, Psalm 130 is one of his favorites, right? And the reason why Luther loved Psalm 130 so much is that it had very clear teaching on humans' sinfulness, right? That, you know what, there's nothing that we have to offer God. We're, we're, We're spiritually bankrupt, And also he talks about that there's so much about God's grace being given to us. And also about, even though Christ's name isn't isn't used, it talks about the redemption that we have through God. It's also a very short psalm, right? And if you have to listen to a preacher preach on a whole psalm, you want to go with one of the short ones. Maybe that's part of the reason why Martin Luther liked it so much, right? But the point is... Uh, Psalm 130 is really special. And what I want to do is I want to preach through this psalm and help you to understand how it's special for you as well. So to begin with, we're going to look at uh, the entire psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Man, did you ever feel like that before? You know, where where things are just rough, where, where life feels like a tidal wave crashing over you. Maybe you're there right now, right? Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Right? I mean, this is talking about iniquities means sins, right? And, and, And if God keeps a record of our sins, who could stand the psalmist writes? But then there's this beautiful gospel, verse 4 and following. But with you, God, with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Wow, right? So as I, as I was studying this psalm and, and trying to figure out how to, to kind of break this down to, into manageable chunks, right? I, I came up with, with three actions that, that we need to respond to God with, right? And the first action is simply this, to cry out to God. Sort of like what I was doing with the kids up here, trying to get them to do, to cry out, Right? And it's something that, that, that God is telling us in his word that we need to do. Now, I'm going to ask you, have you ever been there? Has there ever been that moment? Maybe there's been a series of moments in your life. There's been for me where you just feel the lowest of the lows. You're at the end of your rope, 
and then you're beyond that. You realize you are so far in over your head that you don't know which way to turn, which way to move, and the only thing that you can do is to simply cry out, right? Now, back in my younger days, my wife looks at this car and probably started to twitch a little bit, right? It was a 1983 Chevy Cavalier station wagon. This is not the picture of it. Mine was worse looking than this one. <laughs> Hard to imagine, right? And I was very young and inexperienced when it comes to working on cars. But I had replaced one starter in my life, so that made me an expert. And I thought, well, the starter is bad. I just need to replace the starter. So I've crawled underneath this car, and I'm working on the starter. And I have these big sausage fingers, and I'm trying to manipulate and get the starter out. Finally get the starter out. And then these little metal things fall down as well. I'm like, what are they? You know, Don knows what they are. The, the, you know, the, these are shims that, that they use to adjust how the starter goes in there. And I thought, oh, man, I don't even know how these things fit in here. And then I figured it out, and I thought, okay, that's not too bad. But then they, I think engineers really manufacture cars so they're near impossible to work on, right? Have you ever been there before? And I'm trying to get the starter manipulated in there with these shims, and the shims kept falling, kept falling, and kept falling. And I was like, there's no way I can do this. And then I'm literally with the starter on my chest, underneath the car, I, I cry out to God. God, I'm in over my head. I can't fix this car. I need this car to work. I am my own power washing business. And I'm trying to go out and, and throw the power washer in the back of this thing. And, and you know, I, I need this car to work. I've got jobs lined up. I've got to get this thing fixed. I didn't have the money. I was, I was going through my undergrad, right? So I, I cry out to God. I did the only thing that was within my power, right? And after about 45 more minutes, I was able to get the starter in minus the shims. Who needs shims, right? And I thought, man, this thing's never going to start. And it did. And I tell you what, I spent a lot of time saying thank you to God, right? Now, you may never find yourself underneath the 1983 Chevy Cavalier station wagon trying to put a starter in with the shims properly. But I would bet that you're going to find yourself in, in, in your life at different times crying out, God, I don't know what to do. This, this job that I have, this situation in my life, this problem that has come up, I don't know how to respond. What should I do? And the answer is simple, to cry out. Listen as I reread verses 1 and 2. And I want you to draw a mental picture. And this is a great picture, right? Of this, this young girl who's crying out, right? Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Have you been there before? Out of your depths, your brokenness. O oh Lord, hear my voice. You're not even sure if God's listening to you. Have you been there before where, where you're, you're praying and you feel like your words are bouncing around on the inside of a wall? Hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Now, if some of you have been really blessed in your life and you've never had trials that, that have literally had you on your knees crying, thank God for that. But my guess is you're eventually going to come across that time. And some of you maybe right now are, are in a position. Maybe you don't even know why you're here in church. Maybe it's simply to hear this passage preached to you. Right? When we cry out to God, it's one of the most important actions that we can do. Because it's not us trying to fix the situation. Because frankly, it's beyond our ability. It's us saying, God, you are the creator of the universe. You have all power. You have all authority. You have a cattle on a thousand hills, and you control legions of angels. Lord, help me. Isn't that much more effective than you trying to do it yourself in a very poor way? And the amazing thing is that God not only listens to our cries for help, but responds to them. Now some of you might be thinking, you know what, I don't know about that, Pastor. Because I've been there before, and I've cried out, and I just feel alone, 
and abandoned, and I feel like God isn't listening to me and that God just doesn't care. Well, I want you to know that if you feel that, that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because God not only hears you, but that God has responded and actively working to help you. It may not be the help that you want. It may not be the help that you expect. But God is there in the midst of our chaos. I mean, I love this passage in John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know who's talking there, right? That's Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey guys, I'm going to leave you. I'm no longer going to be physically present with you. But you know, that's a good thing. Because I need to leave so that the other one, the helper, can come. Does anyone know who that helper is? It's the Holy Spirit, right? God... And the person of the Holy Spirit literally has come down from heaven and literally dwells in us as Christians and with us in a very powerful way, right? When that temple curtain was torn in two that separated God from humans, that was symbolic, right? And then the reality of what happened there at the beginning was fulfilled at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came in a very mighty and powerful way And they saw little tongues of fire on top of the Christians, right? And then they started speaking in foreign languages. And everyone's like, hey, they're speaking in my language. Well, hey, they're speaking in my language, right? It wasn't just a bunch of gibberish. It was a bunch of different foreign languages. And it was because of the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And Jesus is saying, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit can come and indwell in you in this very powerful way. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit with a Greek word called the paraclete. And that word oftentimes is translated comforter or counselor. The action of a paraclete in that time was one that was called to be alongside of another. Now when you're going through trials in your life, when you're going through those really dark times and you're wondering, where is God in the midst of this? Remember that word paraclete. That God in a person of the Holy Spirit is right here with you. Is going through this with you. And is going to help you. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, he promises the paraclete to come alongside of us. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13, the second part of verse 5, verse 6 says this. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? When you're going through those dark times, God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Whether you're lying on your bed and you're scared to wake up the next morning, or you're afraid to take a step out of your door because you don't know what's going to happen to you, no matter where you're at in life, God is with you, Christian and will never leave you, and will never forsake you. When does God leave us? Never. When will God turn his back on us? Never. So when I'm underneath that old junkie Chevy Cavalier station wagon, and I felt all alone, I didn't have a mechanic friend handing me wrenches, right? I didn't have someone saying, hey, Rich, just put this here, or put that there, it'll be okay, right? I had God right there with me. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. And what is the action that we are to do? Work harder? No. Pray more? No. Cry out. Is that something that you can do when you're in despair? Yes. Our first action is to cry out. The second action point that we're called to do is to recognize where the forgiveness of our sins comes from. If you look again at your Bibles, if you have them open, Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, it teaches us much about forgiveness. The Bible says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Now my daughter Madeline worked really hard throughout high school, and she saved up a lot of money. And then she had to borrow a bunch of money from her brother, 
And with the money that she saved up and borrowed from, from her brother Moses and eventually paid him back, she bought herself a used pickup truck, right? And it's a nice one. It, it, it's, it's a Dodge Ram 1500. It's all black, right? And it's got the outdoorsman package. It's four-wheel drive. It's really nice. Now, if, if I borrowed her really nice pickup truck and I drove it and I wrecked it, and when I say wrecked it, I don't mean just bumped it. I mean completely wrecked it, right? What would I do? Would I go to my wife and say, Brenda, I'm really sorry, I wrecked Madeline's truck. And then that would make it all right? Of course not, right? I would need to go to Madeline and say, Madeline, I have destroyed your pickup truck, right? She's the only one that has the ability to say, Dad, I forgive you, right? Now, I'm working on my, my, um, my Dodge Grand Caravan. We've got a bunch of parts ordered. They'll be coming in hopefully soon. Now, if I find that I need to get some sort of electronic gizmo, and I borrow it from the, the local dealership here, the local Dodge dealership, when I'm done with it, and I leave it sit outside, and it gets ruined because it rains, because it does rain around here, right? It rains a little bit, destroys this electronic gizmo. Should I go to the Ford dealership and hand them the broken material and say, hey, guys, I'm really sorry, I broke your scanner tool? It would be ridiculous to do that, right? Because the Dodge dealer is the one that gave that to me. The Dodge dealer has ownership of that part, and they lent it to me. And it would be ridiculous for me to go to a, a, a Ford dealer and ask for forgiveness of something that the Dodge dealer did. It's the same thing with our relationship with God. When we violate God's trust, when we commit sins, the number one person we need to go to is God, right? The problem is, is that both Christians and non-Christians find themselves sinning regularly. The Bible says that we sin in thought, word, and deed on a regular basis. If you're not sure, read the Ten Commandments and ask yourself, how good of a job am I doing keeping these Ten Commandments, right? Right? The reality is none of us are doing a very good job. Unfortunately, a lot of times people think, you know what, it's not that big a deal. As long as I try to be a good person, that's what's important, right? Forget about going to God, even though I've offended God. That's really not that important. What's important is this universal law of goodness. Now, we've heard this a lot today in our time, karma, right? A lot of people have heard that. A lot of Christians have, have said that before, right? Oh, you know, karma is going to get them. Karma is going to do this, right? Well, the reality is, is that karma is not Christian, and it's not even true, and it comes from a, a Buddhist religion, right? Karma is basically that if you want to be a better person, be a better person. If you want to have better things done to you, then do better things to other people. The reality is, is that karma calls us to work harder at being better people to others so that good stuff happens to us. But that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches, right? Forgiveness of our sins is never through our works. It's never through our being better people, trying harder, doing more, right? John chapter 14, verse 6 is very clear. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Psalm 130 reminds us that forgiveness of sins is found in God. That's where we need to go. When we cry out, the next thing we do when we acknowledge our sinfulness is to go to God to seek his forgiveness. Our first action point is that God calls us to cry out. Our second action point is that we are called to recognize that forgiveness of our sins is found through faith in Jesus. And this brings us to our third and last action point this morning, which is that as a result of Jesus Christ, we are called to wait patiently on the Lord. Waiting's tough, especially for me. But let's look at verses 5 through 8. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, 
He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now, as I was reading this, do you notice a word that's repeated, especially in the first couple verses there, a lot? What is that? Wait, right? Think about that word, wait. What is it you do when you wait? Nothing. Notice, Christian, that God doesn't say, work harder, pray more, get on your knees and say enough Hail Marys or whatever else you think, right? There's none of that. After you've done, spent time crying out, and maybe you need to confess some sins to the Lord, what are we called to do now? Wait. God doesn't tell us that we need to do more. God doesn't say, well, you need to share this burden, right? You need to be a better prayer warrior. You need to go to church. Oh, you skipped out on the quarterly business meeting. You better go the next four of them, right? Right? has nothing to do with that. God simply says, wait. And then there's another action, right? This is another tough one that's going to be hard for us to do, right? Because we cry out, we confess our sins to the Lord, then we wait. You know what the next action that God calls us to do? It's in the beginning of verse 7. You have your Bibles, you see it? What does it say? Hope in the Lord. Do you get all this passiveness that we are doing? That God is the one that's doing the work? After we wait, what are we called to do now? Hope. God's in control. God's in charge. In the midst of the storms, right? Maybe you go out to the beach and you see that cool lighthouse and it looks great when the sun is shining. Why is there a lighthouse? Because a lot of times those storms rage, right? And the waves are breaking and you can't see where to go. And we need that lighthouse to point us, to provide hope. And that's what the psalmist says our response to God should be, is to hope. God tells us in his word that we Christians are going to have crosses to bear. That means that we're going to have hardships, that we're going to experience loss. And as a result of our faith in Jesus, life oftentimes doesn't get easier, it gets harder. And when you find yourself struggling with a burden that is beyond your abilities to handle, we're called to cry out to God. And we need to remember it is through Jesus that we are forgiven, not through being better people or working harder. And which leads us to do this really tough work of waiting. And as we wait for the Lord, God says, hope in me. Right? And then the psalmist, he writes these strange words of a, of a, of a watchman waiting. What is a watchman doing, right? A watchman was oftentimes a soldier who was posted as guard at night. Because if you're going to attack a city, it doesn't make sense to kind of sneak in and try to attack during the day. You do it at night. So that was really important for a person to stand watch and to stand guard. But for those of you that have had to stand guard, or maybe even just had to to be up, what's the best time for that watchman? Is it when they're starting Or when it's over. It's when it's over, right? When that watchman sees the sun crest over the horizon. Oh, finally. I can go home. I can rest. I'm done waiting. And that watchman has a hope that that morning is coming. That eventually they're going to be relieved from their duty, right? And that's the type of hope that we are called to have. That the end is coming, right? The trials and the hardships that you face, you may never completely get over. The Apostle Paul struggled with things and and cried out to God and said, God, heal me. We don't know exactly what it is. The Bible refers to it as a thorn in the flesh. Could have been a physical ailment. Could have been a spiritual ailment. Maybe he he was struggling with depression emotionally. Who knows? And you know what God said? My grace is sufficient for you. Hang in there. Struggle through it. Because I'm not going to heal you on this side of heaven. And what did Paul do? Did he shake his fist at God and say, you don't love me? No. He had hope. He had faith that that morning was coming. That one day soon, he would be taken home. (laughs) 
and stand in the presence of Jesus. So likewise, we are at a point in time where the turn of Jesus will be soon. We should be like a diligent watchman standing guard in the wee hours before sunrise. Don't grow weary in your faith. The dawn of a new age is quickly approaching. This life is hard, yes. And it might be really hard for you right now, but I want to remind you to cry out to the Lord, to wait on the Lord, and to have hope in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the truth that we don't have to wait and cry out and not be sure if things were going to work out. Lord, you are in control. Lord, I just ask that you would help us all to understand that you're not calling us to do more, but to do less. To not figure it out on ourselves, but to lean on you. To put our understanding in you and in your ways. And to trust you. To have hope in you. And Father, we thank you that this hope that we have is a sure hope, an assurance not something that we can guess at, not something that, that is like winning the lottery that we hope, but something that is an assured promise. Lord, forgive us for those times for trying to take control and do things on our own. Forgive us for those times where we've not trusted you as we should. And Lord, help us to let go of our pain, to let go of our problems, and to give them over to you. And we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.